thank you for the opportunity uh, to present to you today, uh, supporting uh, recovery in ICU survivors outside of the ICU. So my objectives for today are to talk about uh, what the patient needs after discharge from the ICU, a little bit about support groups and post-ICU clinics, and next steps, uh, new innovative research that's coming uh, shortly. So I want you to think about outcomes of ICU care and what matters. What matters to you as the provider? What matters to the patients? and what matters to their family members or caregivers. So what do patients need? I'm oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Um, so what do patients need um, after discharge from the ICU? The needs are different. Uh, the needs that they have in the ICU uh, are different than they need the needs that they have on the ward uh, when they're discharged home or discharged to a rehab facility. Uh, so in this study, uh, it's a nursing uh, study by a, a Swedish group, um, and they were um, completing uh, interviews of ICU uh, survivors, uh, survivors that had recovered from critical illness, um, and they were in the ICU for uh, four to 14 days. And several themes evolved from this research. Um, and basically, they uh, talked about what their recovery was like. Um, they had to create meaning. They had to understand what critical illness was. Uh, they had to become accustomed to a new body. Uh, they had significant changes with their body. Uh, and they had to reconcile the feeling of almost dying to now being a survivor and how they could live a new life. So learning to live in a new body is different for every patient. Some patients have scars that are visible, and some patients have, uh, unfortunately, um, issues with psychiatric issues, with overcoming anxiety, um, and thinking that this critical illness may happen again. So they have great fear of becoming sick and having to return to the hospital. They also have pain loss of their previous life due to the weakness that they've acquired. And some, in this particular study, the patients were younger, so they had some financial difficulties because they were unable to return to work. Patients reflect on their hospitalization after they get home. They look, they start to think about things that happened in the ICU as well as the wards and they have real fears. Uh, they have fears of death, uh, fears of panic, and agony over what actually occurred to them uh, during their critical illness. Often there's a disconnect between the providers and the patients, but all these feelings are very real to them during the time that they're in the hospital. Patients are determined to go home. So whether we realize it or not, when they're sedated, most patients have some internal resilience that they're fighting to go home. And this is a quote from one of the patients. And they said that they felt good when they were in the ICU, they felt loved, they felt cared for, and they appreciated the fact that there were people fighting for them to survive, and they felt that. So as providers, uh, we need to recognize that patients can feel when we're fighting for them to survive, whether they can communicate or not, uh, they do have a feeling that you are fighting for them. Uh, patients uh, in this particular study uh, during the interview said that they all had a sense that they were gonna die at one time during their ICU stay. Uh, when they survived critical illness, they lived their life differently. They live in the moment. Uh, their family, relatives, uh, really put context into the meaning of life, and they look at life very differently after surviving a critical illness. 
the patients also talked about the transitions of care, moving from the ICU to the ward to home. Each step along the way presented challenges, and they had real fears of having to go back to the ICU. Uh, so when they were on the ward, uh, patients were concerned that the physicians and the nursing staff were not aware of their critical illness and weren't doing the things that needed to be done. Uh, so they were afraid of actually having to go back to the ICU. Uh, so this created some anxiety for them. Uh, in this uh, review, they're identifying support needs following uh, critical illness. And this is a review of the qualitative literature. And it actually was broken down into a framework. Uh, I won't go into all the details here because I'll give you examples in the next few slides. But you can see here patients were seeking information. Uh, they uh, require emotional support, uh, instrumental support as well as appraisal, and appraisal is basically uh, feedback. Uh, there are different time points where patients need support. Uh, so they have it this, in this particular study, they broke it down into five uh, different sections. Uh, the ICU is where the initial event occurred. Uh, on the ward, uh, the goal is to stabilize the patient. Uh, and then prepare the patient for discharge. Uh, once the patient is discharged, they consider there's a short term where they're trying to adapt to their new surroundings. Um, and then long term, they're adapting to their new physical condition and challenges that they have. So for in informational support in the ICU, patients want good communication. They also want us to repeat information so they, um, the patients in this, in this uh, particular review was over and over again that information is given to patients and families and they can't remember due to the stressful situation. So the recommendation is to repeat information uh, continually while they're in the ICU. Uh, when they're on the ward, uh, they want to focus on progress, uh, how they're doing with their recovery, and they want the staff to focus on you know, the progress that they've made uh, from leaving the ICU. And when they're home, they want to understand the information that's regarding their critical illness. They want to understand their critical illness and what they can expect as far as long-term outcomes and some sequelae due to their critical illness. So as far as information needs, there are some ICUs that uh, prepare diaries for patients. Um, so the caregivers write in the, doc in the diaries, the providers uh, document in the diaries. And based on this uh, literature search, a literature review, sometimes diaries work for patients and sometimes they do not. So there's mixed um, uh, results there. Uh, patients uh, want information in the form of booklets and resources. So if we can give uh, patients and families resources as far as pamphlets, booklets, websites, uh, they really want information, they just don't know where to find it. As far as emotional needs, uh, in the ICU, uh, in these review this review article, it indicated that uh, patients want to feel comfort in words and touch so what we say matters to patients, whether we think they're awake and alert or not. Uh, they do hear us. Um, and they also, throughout the whole hospitalization, want the support of their family. Uh, they want their family present. Uh, they want pictures of their family when the family is not present. Um, overall, emotionally, the family um, support was uh, significantly important to the patients. When patients are on the ward, they felt a relocation anxiety, which means that when they were in the ICU, uh, they had a nurse, maybe one patient or two patients, and they felt that they were attended to all the time. Uh, when they moved to the floor, um, the nurse may have six or eight patients and may not be as attentive. So they felt a lot of anxiety uh, due to being uh, transferred uh, to the floor. Um, they also felt isolated and neglected. 
Uh, when the patients went home, they had vivid memories of their ICU stay. Um, it affected their sleep patterns. Um, they worried and had fear uh, for months. Um, and they continue to need emotional support and psychological support uh, when they are um, in the home environment. And not surprisingly, uh, patients who do not have family at home have more issues with anxiety and fear because they don't have that social support. Uh, instrumental needs, uh, patients experience lack of sleep, um, especially in the ICU, uh, which also kind of crosses over to some of the delirium that it, they experience. Um, they also have a need for personal hygiene. So they want to feel clean. Uh, they want someone to wash their hair. Um, and they want pain relief. On the wards, uh, they want the clinicians to know that they're not ready to be independent. Uh, we can't assume just because they left the ICU and they're transferred to the floor that they can take care of themselves. Uh, they still need help uh, from the nurses and the professionals on that unit. And when they're home, uh, they need to relearn actually how to take care of themselves. So survivors of critical illness really have um, a, a tough road ahead of them, um, and sometimes we don't necessarily think that, uh, about those things when they're in the ICU. Uh, patients also have uh, appraisal needs and spiritual needs. Appraisal uh, needs is basically the, um, the need for information and feedback, and what the um, this information actually provided was to say that there seems to be a disconnect between the ICU and the ward communication, and patients feel that uh, when they're transferred to another unit. Uh, from a spiritual um, uh, place, patients feel that they've had an experience where they thought they were going to die. Um, so it really changed their outlook on life. Uh, they live for the moment at this particular uh, time point. So again, uh, having a critical illness really changed uh, the patients uh, for a significant uh, period of time. In uh, one of the studies, the, um, the, uh, the interviews were uh, conducted with patients that were actually uh, 65 years or less. Um, so we recognize that patients may not uh, be able to return to work. And this is a, um, a recent study that uh, looked at uh, critical illness and the ability to return to work. And as you can see here, um, at three months, only 33% are able to return to work. At six months, 55%. And at 12 months, uh, 56%. So again, the majority of patients um, are not able to return to work after um, surviving a critical illness. And it's not unique to the U.S., it's worldwide. So let's talk a little bit about uh, support groups. Uh, this is something that we uh, may be able to implement, uh, and there are um, several uh, sites uh, throughout the world that have implemented uh, support groups. So what is a peer support group? It's a process of giving and receiving encouragement and assistance in achieving long-term recovery. Um, this is our uh, first support group at my hospital, which was, um, we had our first support group in June. Uh, we had one family uh, attend. Uh, you can see we had more staff than um, attendees, but it was very eye-opening for the staff to hear the experience of a patient who survived critical illness. Uh, there are a lot of motives uh, for using peer support, and peer support means that there are other people that have experienced the same type of um, process that you've been going through. So when you have a peer support group, the idea is that you invite um, survivors of critical illness that maybe have been out of uh, the hospital for a year, and you invite um, people that have been out of the hospital for three months, and they're there to support one another. And basically what it helps to do is make the um, 
gives them an, a feeling that they're not alone, that there are other people that are experiencing what they're experiencing in recovery. Uh, so there are different types of support groups. Uh, there are online support groups, face-to-face uh, -face meetings, which is what we have. Uh, some of the groups are structured. Uh, some provide education. Um, and then there's a mix where we have uh, education and peer support. So there's a variety of models uh, that potentially could work. This is a, a study that was uh, published. It was a, a pilot study uh, with uh, peer support for patients with traumatic brain injury. So they had individuals that had traumatic brain injury and they were matched with um, patients who were recently recovering from a traumatic brain injury. And the goal was to uh, have phone contacts and have the, them participate in social activities. Uh, and they looked at uh, depression at uh, three months um, so they did experience increased social activity. Uh, both the uh, peer and the, the uh, early recover felt that um, it did help with them, uh, with their satisfaction with the process, but they still had uh, depressive symptoms at three months. Uh, in this study, they had um, a, a support for men uh, who had recently had uh, bypass surgery, um, and there were, uh, what they did was an intervention of telephone-based volunteers, so they had patients who survived um, and were recovering from uh, bypass surgery, and they called um, patients who were recently discharged weekly over the six-week period, and their primary outcome was to assess for depression. Um, the depression scores in, in this particular study were similar at six weeks and 12 weeks. Um, they, all patients felt that they had sufficient social support. Uh, the most important part um, from this study was that they found that um, those that participated in the um, telephone-based follow-up, the intervention group, actually had less um, health service use. So they had less uh, visits to the um, doctor's office and less visits to the emergency room. Uh, so there was some benefit, um, although depression was similar in both groups. Uh, starting a support group or um, an ICU clinic is uh, challenging. Uh, there were 21 sites um, in the US and um, Australia and the UK that are participating in um, collaboratives for clinics and peer support groups. And based on the information that was provided from these participants, they found that there were some uh, positive things that we could do to start peer support groups in clinics and then there are barriers. Um, and the majority of the, um, the positive impacts that you could have are related to how providers are um, energized about this idea they have administrative support, um, and then there's teamwork. And some of the barriers are uh, financial, um, how are we going to bring the patients in, um, and identifying the appropriate patients. So we're still learning uh, how to do this in the most effective way. Um, there are several. Um, studies that actually looked at um, survivor support um, services that after the patient survives an ICU stay that they have a follow-up with a, a nurse. Um, so in this review, there were four studies um, that were led by nurses and one study that was led by a multidisciplinary team. And uh, they looked at um, you know, whether or not it made a difference at 12 months um, for mortality, um, health-related quality of life, and uh, post-traumatic stress. And the conclusion um, from this review was that there was insufficient evidence uh, to determine whether ICU follow-up services are effective uh, meeting, uh, addressing the unmet needs of uh, ICU survivors. So uh, it's important to know that um, this research is new. Um, we have more uh, survivors of critical illness, um, and this is work that I think is ongoing. Uh, so the information that we have here in the review articles is um, is uh, fairly new, um, and I think this is something where uh, we need to think about what we can do differently um, as far as research in this uh, space. 
Um, so we focus a lot of attention on the, um, the patient and what it's, the recovery is like for them, but there's also um, concerns that we have related to the family members and what support do they need. Um, in this particular study by um, uh, Dr. Haynes, uh, was uh, published in, in 2018, um, basically looking at um, factors in uh, family members uh, pre-ICU, uh, during the ICU, and post-ICU. Um, and it's a little bit, I can see that it's a little bit difficult um, to see. But the pre-ICU factors basically look at the stresses that um, family members have even without having a family member in the ICU as far as whether or not they work, um, do they care for other people um, outside of uh, this um, family member that they have that has critical illness. Again, the stressors that they have um, on their everyday life. ICU factors is challenging because now they have um, a patient who's in the ICU. Uh, they have to learn how to communicate with the providers. Uh, so this is a different environment. Uh, Post-ICU, they have to learn how to be a caregiver. Uh, maybe this is something that they've never experienced before, um, and they need support. Um, and what are we doing to support someone who's caring for someone who's recovering from critical illness? Um, there are drivers. There are financial challenges. Um, they have to learn how to receive and give information. Uh, we have to be concerned about their social well-being as well as their health. Uh, relatives of ICU patients have emotional reactions very similar to the patients themselves. Uh, they have a sense of shock when they hear a diagnosis or uh, changes in the patient's condition. Uh, they have true fear. Um, they also have anxiety and depression. And they have some uncertainty and abandonment when they're in the room um, and they may not know uh, what is actually happening with their family member. So caregivers need support too, and I think we can all do uh, a little bit better, I think, in uh, some of the, the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So what are the, some of the uh, next steps in supporting ICU recovery? Uh, there are several hospitals that started uh, ICU clinics. Uh, this is uh, an example of um, one is in Vanderbilt. Um, in the U.S., and they have a multidisciplinary team uh, that follows patients um, after they survive critical illness, so they're able to address their needs, um, provide um, assessment, follow-up referrals, um, and again, it helps the patient and the family remain connected uh, to the ICU staff. Um, I, I'm not going to say this is easy. It's very difficult, um, uh, and it's, it's fairly new. Uh, so um, we'll have to continue to watch the literature that comes out of the work that's being done. Um, if you recall, I said that patients have difficulty sleeping in the ICU. Um, the patients um, after discharge also continue to have difficulty sleeping. Uh, so some of the suggestions are that we assess uh, patients for sleep disorders um, as well as sleep apnea and then consider their quality of sleep prior to um, admission. Um, if you remember, I said that um, patients want resources. Um, they want to know where they can get good information. And these are some examples. Uh, there are websites available um, that you can uh, point your patients to. Uh, this one basically uh, talks about what it's like to recover from critical illness. Uh, this one here is uh, through the Society of Critical Care Medicine. It talks about discharge and what life is like um, when the patients go home. Um, and then this is just an example of a brochure that uh, we created at our hospital, and we put these in the admission packets. Um, it talks about what life is like after the ICU. Um, we talk about our support group. Uh, we talk a little bit about post-intensive care syndrome. Um, and this is included in all of our ICU packets. This is fairly new for us, uh, but we're hoping that it'll be information that'll be useful uh, to patients and families as they move through the recovery process.
Um, as I said, uh, studying ICU um, survivorship um, is fairly new. Uh, this is a research study that's being uh, conducted currently in Australia, and they're using a web-based uh, recovery program, and they are um, assessing uh, the patient's mental well-being, um, outcome measures that will include demographics, uh, the level of family support, um, hospital readmissions and costs. So I think in order for this field uh, to move forward, uh, we're certainly going to need more studies like this in randomized controlled trials in order to say uh, whether some therapies are working and some are not. Uh, so this is a field I think that's going to be expanding um, over the next several years. And with that, um, I just want to refresh us that we covered what patients and um, families need after ICU discharge. We talked a little bit about support groups and, again, the next steps of uh, what will be coming uh, down the road. Thank you so much for your attention.